Hello everyone, we're back again with another critique video today on the channel. We have Plant Chompers. The video title is Dr. Anthony Chafee, Plants Are Trying to Kill You, which I've heard Anthony make that claim before. I have had many requests to react to Plant Chompers. They have 111,000 subscribers, pretty impressive, and obviously they're plant-based. That is fine, because here in this space, we don't, at least completely, ridicule these people. I'm being facetious. I know that many people like to cast a lot of aspersions on plant-based dieters and all that stuff. I used to be plant-based, actually, so I get where they're coming from. I don't think all of them are evil people. The vegans that are the climate and moral activists, they get under my skin, and a lot of them are actually not moral at all, and that's the problem. They're anti-human, not pro-animal. That is different. But I am not familiar with this man. I believe that this man's name is Chris. I've heard a lot about him, particularly from someone related to him who has not very fond things to say about him. That his dad was on a so-called Atkins diet, and that's what led to his heart issues, and he died of a heart attack. Well, that's complete bullshit. But we're only going to be critiquing his behavior and claims in this video, and maybe future ones if we do any more on him. Anyway, we're just going to jump directly into this. But first, just like always, please subscribe to the Patreon if you haven't already to gain access to one week early uploads, ad-free content, uncensored content, and one extra video per week. And also, please, if you have not already, buy my book Contraindicated, a closer look and revision of mainstream health axioms that have perpetuated illness, disorder, and disease for over a century. And with that being said, now let's jump directly into this a few weeks ago, I had a tough choice to make, and when I made it, a few hundred commenters wrote, You chose poorly. There was a firestorm in the comment section. The problem is, I watched a viral speech that Anthony Chafee gave called Plants Are Trying to Kill You. I have watched that video before when it was freshly uploaded, I believe. Anthony Chafee, if you're watching, I'd love to talk to you as well. What stopped me in my tracks is that Anthony based that line on the career of Professor Bruce Ames, whose career can be summarized with the line, plants are trying to save you. And Dr. Ames brought receipts. He published vast amounts of data showing that the lowest quartile of fruit and vegetable consumers had double the cancer risk of the upper quartile. Okay, so there's a few problems already. So there's three that I can think of. First of all, just because Anthony cited someone's work does not mean that he will agree with that person's conclusions. For example, Hitler was a horrible person, but he also said that we should all stop smoking. You're gonna say he was wrong for that? You can take that and say, well, you know, Hitler said to stop smoking. Well, doesn't mean Hitler was awesome. In fact, he's one of the most evil people to, at least recorded people to have ever lived. So, done with that. Second claim, you said that this person showed that the people with the highest fruit and vegetable, basically the quartile of people in, with the highest fruit and vegetable consumption had the lowest risk of whatever. I kind of tuned it out because it's such a trite, at least the structure of the sentence is so trite, it's so hackneyed that I kind of just tuned out. Because at the end of the day, you used the word risk improperly. Risk is a cause and effect statement and there are no studies to inform upon the risk of any heart health outcome or disease process as it relates to any aspect of human nutrition over any given period of time. Throughout the entire time, human nutrition science has existed, and actually inferential statistics as a whole, which is what human nutrition science is based on, because inferential statistics makes no claim about causality. You cannot establish causality with inferential statistics without additional machinery, and that's very complicated in and of itself, and is really never done, actually, especially in the area of human nutrition science. And the third thing was basically directly related to the risk statement, which is that this is just an association, blah, 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 blah. There's many other confounders. There are people that have lived to 100 years old and have not developed cancer at all, died peacefully, and their recommendations to people is to drink every day and smoke every day. So, done with that, aren't we, Chris? Scientists are my heroes, and Dr. Ames is considered one of the true greats, having received almost every award a scientist can receive short of a Nobel Prize. Okay, so who cares about that? Because I don't. So, great. I mean, Hitler became a dictator and was the leader of his country and was going to be the leader of the world if he carried out his plan, just to use the same analogy. Was he great? Nope. So my dilemma was, do I listen to an inner voice, which is telling me, just let it slide, Chris. One less thing on your list and anything you say will be- I would have said, just let it slide. That would have been my personal recommendation, but anyway. That is tribal, but I was contending with other voices. You have to say something, honey. He's on the cover of the supermarket tabloid with huge circulation making outrageous claims. Well, that's your opinion. That was awesome, actually. I loved seeing that. Absolutely loved seeing that. I saw it in my local stores around here, Walmart. I live in the middle of nowhere. Absolute nowhere. We live in a village. Population is very, very low, and we saw them around here. That was awesome. So me Dr. Oz vibes, only worse. So I bought a packet of these tabloids. Well, one of them is more voracious than the other, so. Hey to see what so many Americans are reading. 1.6 million circulation and so many more impressions because they're face out at the newsstand. Dr. Stork says H2O melts fat. Eight pounds. 
just nonsense. It's just ridiculous. The sensationalism. I mean, this is the entire reason why so many people, that like most people don't believe the magazines anymore. It's been that way for decades. What is this? H2O dissolves fat? No, it literally does not do any such thing. They don't even fucking mix. Anyway, this video is very long, so we better get to this. 10 inches a week. And they have anti-aging tricks. Drink beer to prevent Alzheimer's. It's ridiculous. Yes, so basically what your point is, is just because Anthony Chafee was on a magazine doesn't mean his information is correct. Correct. Absolutely correct. You are correct, Chris. So what? I thought for sure Women's World must be misquoting Dr. Chafee when he said he lost 23 pounds in 10 days while multiplying his caloric intake by five. Well, he didn't multiply his caloric intake by five at all. I mean, if he did, then it's simply zero because five times zero is still zero and you cannot consume a calorie, okay? If anyone's curious to hear more about that, please binge my channel, but particularly refer to the playlist called Calories. And specifically, I would refer you to the video I did on conservative influencer Matt Walsh on that to get the best breakdown. You can skip to the very end of the video to find my summary. You can also buy my book, Contraindicated, once again, link in the description below. There's a section on that in chapter three. But anyway, are you just gonna say that he's wrong? You have no evidence the contrary. I mean, he didn't prove it either. People have just as much evidence to believe his claim that he did that as much as they have evidence to not believe it. You know, I lost 23 pounds just drip ditching vegetables and increasing the amount of feet. I quintupled my calories and lost 23 pounds. Okay. So was that also with fruit? I would bet that, you know, he means plants in general. That would be extremely impressive if in 10 days he lost 23 pounds just by cutting out vegetables. That I would find hard to believe. But I have no reason to write off Anthony here. He may have just not said it completely accurately. 23 pounds in 10 days. So I looked into Dr. Chafee and couldn't get Paul Simon's famous lyrics out of my head. It's every generation throws a hero up a pop chart. Just six years ago, when he posted a photo sipping coconut water and maybe drinking a beer, he got 14 likes and one commenter who said, I knew you loved coconut. He's handsome, well-built, well-spoken, played rugby, got an MD from the Royal College of Surgeons, volunteered among the Rohingya. I think he deserves all the credit in the world for those things. Six years after that lonesome Instagram post, his social media accounts are on fire. He runs circles around me and people I admire like Gil Carvalho and Simon Hill. He speaks at conferences, offers a paid coaching program, blasts out emails, endorses products, all while identifying as a neurosurgeon. Maybe he'll be the next Andrew Huberman. And it's the number one health and fitness podcast in the world. I hope not because Andrew Huberman is not very impressive. Crushing it. Some people posted, I should man up and debate Dr. Chafee. I'm afraid my social media presence is too small for him, but I did watch a debate between him and a popular vegan Dr. Dr. Anthony Chafee, if you're watching, by the way, I'm, I'm not going to sugarcoat this, and I think you might know this already. You are better at doing discussions, I think, than you are at doing debates, and I may very well be the same person, actually. Debates are a different thing. It doesn't mean that you're wrong. It means, well, debating may just not be your thing. You can be extremely wrong on everything and win debates. Totally different skill set. Totally different skill set. Which is why it's risky for anyone to do debates. I'm down to do them, but I prefer to have a discussion, so meet in the middle there. Talking face-to-face -face is important, but debating, that's just about point scoring, but. The result was Dr. Nagra's followers were sure he won the debate, partly because of his superior knowledge about studies. And Dr. Chafee's followers were sure he- Oh, hold on a minute. So you just implied that if you win a debate, you have superior knowledge. At least that was the implication I derived. If that wasn't your implication, then fair enough. But um, I just covered that. Debate partly because he went back to compelling first principles. Like surely you're familiar with the nurse's health study or health professionals follow-up study. What are the inherent issues with that? We shouldn't be looking at those studies. We should be going to first no. principles. What are we so, biologically designed so, so, to so, no, but I agree with that. And I think there's a better way to putting it. Human nutrition science that he was referring to, Dr. Nagra, is not science. First of all, it's not even a hard science, but also it really isn't science because it's based upon inferential statistics and science requires experimentation. And you cannot, in the area of human nutrition science, control for human beings. You can't experiment on them because it requires controlling them. So if you stop being so myopic, you expand your horizon and you look at things like paleoanthropology, inferential and also chemical, in the case of isotope analyses, done before the agrarian revolution, by the way, you combine those findings, which show that it's hypercarnivorous, not fully, sure, hypercarnivorous, with biochemical facts. Look into the Randall cycle, for example. That's a good one to start with. Binge my channel about that. Or watch the video that was just released yesterday at the time of recording this with Professor Mark Kay that I did on the Randall cycle in further detail. You combine it with comparative anatomy. You combine it with physics when you start talking about calories, actually just for fun, done. The answer becomes abundantly patent.
opinion is the debate did require a lot of knowledge about scientific papers to fully understand. Which okay, fair enough. So what though? Because I just covered this science. So one of the reasons that I'm not as well versed in this science as I am with all the others is because I decided to prioritize the other hard sciences because of the fact that they're hard sciences. This science isn't. I have the rudimentary level down, sure. But in terms of inferential statistics, if anyone has actually studied statistics, you'll understand that it is the most difficult area and most complicated area of mathematics, arguably. You've got things like calculus and all that stuff and whatever, fine. But one of the reasons it's so much more difficult is because it's so different than other math and it picks from from different areas of math. It's a lot to consider. The fascinating question, how did so many people come away from the debate so sure their guy won? After that debate, well, because ideology is a powerful influence. However, it goes back to what I just said, just because someone won or lost a debate does not mean they are right or wrong. That's not what confers correctness and veracity upon someone. I had three questions. One, what are Anthony's first principles? Two, what are the forces that cause one of your friends to believe one thing passionately and another friend the opposite thing just as passionately? Okay, first of all, I already covered that, but second of all, why does that matter with respect to this discussion here? Because the implications with this title associated with the context of what your channel typically does or what the videos on your channel entail implies that you are going to rebut Anthony's claim that plants are trying to kill you and probably a little extra, Anthony Chafee as a whole, given the introduction. But why does it have anything to do with that? Are you going to try and break that down so as to disprove the people that said that Anthony Chafee won the debate? Because that also begs the question, that's a begging the question fallacy, that once again, if you win a debate, you are necessarily right and vice versa. So anyway. Three, what makes us choose the nutrition heroes we throw up the pop charts? The well, that's multifaceted. This is none of those questions require much knowledge of scientific studies to answer. Let's start with first principles. There was a major study that was done out of uh, the University of Tel Aviv in Israel from Professor Mickey Bendor. This showed that humans have been hypercarnivorous, apex predators for at least two million years. He's basing that on paleoanthropologist Mickey Bendor, who has made the rounds on the carnivore channels. The basic uh, template is that we have to eat what we were, we were evolved to eat. I have it. Yes, because of the fact that genes respond and evolve over the course of a long time, let's just put it that way, under positive and negative selection pressures, and they respond to the environment in which you place them, part of the environment being the food you eat, your diet, basically. So yeah, absolutely. Of course, I just want to make the caveat here, you shouldn't just base it on just those isotope analyses, because once again, you should base it on the big picture, the conclusion that you derive from not only paleoanthropology, but biochemistry and comparative anatomy, for example. Those two especially, really. Anyway. I think it's fair to say he is controversial. He's not a major voice in paleoanthropology, but he's not considered a kook either. Every paleoanthropologist does say eating meat did have a big influence on human evolution. But doesn't it feel wise to hear second opinions from more prominent, less controversial anthropologists? I'm gonna well, now hold on a minute. Just because someone is less controversial doesn't mean that they are more voracious, which seemed to be your implications. When I keep saying these seems to be these implications, it's because I'm being very careful because that's an opinion. They could not have been his implications, but that's what a reaction channel is all about. It's my reaction and it's my derivation. Anyway, let's listen to Christina Warriner. Medical scientist. And I study the health and dietary histories of ancient peoples using bone biochemistry and ancient DNA. And so if we take a step back and we'd say, well, what can we really learn about the Paleolithic diets around the world? There are some general um, observations we can make. One is that they are regionally variable. People who live in the Arctic have and always will eat something different than people who live in the tropics. They have different resources. That is true. This is why whenever people do stable nitrogen and carbon isotope analyses, not only do they have to make sure that those bones originated from the same or the relatively the same area, but they also have to make sure that they were from relatively the same time period because the isotopes themselves can change over the course of thousands of years, millennia. So that that's also important to understand. Yes, that is true. You also have to understand that people post agricultural revolution, which by the way, varies in terms of when that occurred in each region. So if you want to be super safe, you could do the isotope analysis on the remains from 50,000 plus years ago. We usually say it's around 11,000 to 13,000. I go up to 13,000 years ago that the agrarian revolution really ossified. You have to make sure though that it was pre-agricultural revolution because then, then everything changed. Everything changed. And if you want to say that, well, you know, we started eating plants that long ago, so we're evolved to eat them, therefore, or at least more evolved. You can, you can make the argument that we're more evolved to eat them. And I would actually tend to say, 
the, probably the case. Maybe a lot of people, depending on your genealogy, are designed to have 10, 20 grams of carbs a day. I don't know. But what we can say is that 13,000 years in the perspective of evolution is a flash in the pan, really. It's nothing. 13,000 divided by four and a half million converted into a percentage I don't even think is 1%. And then if you take our current species that has existed for 350,000, that's like 2.7%, I think. So either way, we've been eating plants for a very, very small amount of time. People who live in places where there are no plants tend to eat more animals, and people who live in places where there are plants tend to eat more plants. My name is Peter. Of course, yes. However, now go back, trace back 50,000 years ago, and see how many types of plants there were as compared to today, and see how big they were compared to today as well. For example, the Bible, which is a historical text, will actually refer to vegetables in the older translations, not as vegetables, but as herbs. Now, you can speculate as to why that is. I would opine that that's because of the fact that they were extremely small. I'm a paleoanthropologist. I study human evolution, and more specifically, I reconstruct the diets of our ancient ancestors. Our diets varied over time and space with shifting availabilities of different kinds of foods. Correct. I mean, who's arguing against this? No one's arguing against this that I'm aware of. No. It's very difficult, I think, given my current knowledge of the topic, when using stable nitrogen and carbon isotope analyses, for example, to figure out what kinds of plants were eaten because those analyses look at the protein. They analyze the collagen of the long bones of ancient human remains. In fact, this is what allowed our ancestors to find something to eat no matter where they roamed. Whether it's up in the high Arctic, where nearly all of their food was marine mammals and fish, or down by the equator, where they could take 70% of their calories from... Not calories. Melons and starchy roots. In effect... Starchy roots? How long ago are we talking? Because starchy roots are really the result of human hybridization because roots and tubers back then weren't very starchy. In fact, uh, we spit out the fiber whenever we would consume them. Some cultures actually still do that, I believe. Our evolution has prepared us for a versatility that's allowed us to take over the world. Yeah, we do have versatility, which is the entire reason why people can survive on a plant-based diet for as long as they can. For decades, actually. Absolutely. We also have a forgiverous past, evinced by our teeth, actually. Yes, from pre four and a half million years ago, basically. Back to the earliest human ancestors, back to six or seven million years ago, we probably had a- Well, hold on a minute. Six or seven million years ago, diet was very, very different. Very different. We were not carnivores back then. We weren't even hyper carnivores. We were frugivores. Omnivorous diet, so eating plants and animals, um, eating things like fruit. Mostly plants back then, actually, I believe. And leaves and berries and probably small animals, maybe insects, lizards, eggs, all sorts of things. Kind of anything we can get our hands on. Yeah, six or seven million years ago, sure. Uh-huh. An earth scientist by background, and one of the basic principles of earth science is the processes we see today are the very ones that shaped the earth in the past. And what we see today is that several species What does that mean? stand out in their ability to live almost everywhere because they can eat almost anything and stay alive. Human Okay, yes. So you can eat a lot of things and stay alive. Well, you can do that with plants. But does that mean that it is indicated for us to consume? Not necessarily. Not at all, actually. That's why you also have to expand your horizons outside of paleoanthropology because just because you can establish what our ancestors that are closer or farther, depending on what remains you're looking at, ate doesn't necessarily mean that's what we should be eating, which is actually a vegan argument typically. But what we can say is that if we were eating that way regularly for a set amount of time, for a long time, millions of years, and it's consistent, with comparing those remains and you get the same sort of results, plus or minus certain error, let's say, or variation, then you can say, given how we know genes work, this is cell biology, that they have adapted to that stimulus and have evolved around it because they adapt to the environment in which you place them, part of that environment being the food that you regularly eat. Why do you think you can change your LDL level by changing your diet? It's because the genes that are responsible for producing LDL, for example, let's just take LDL as an example, respond to dietary stimuli. And so that's where we make our inferences. This type of science we make inferences from. This is associative and chemical paleoanthropology that we're talking about. Anyway, I like looking at biochemistry and cellular biology, personally, more so. It's what I focus on primarily. But anyway. That's and cockroaches, am I right? What is that? I don't really know. You don't know, hmm. and you're eating it. You know, if you can sort of muscle your way past the gag reflex, all kinds of food possibilities open up. 
I hope I didn't offend any adorable rats or cockroaches by associating them with humans. Wait, it was tail. Ugh. Oh my god, his tail's going in my mouth. We're so adaptable, most parents don't think twice about feeding their children soda and cotton candy, but we recoil at the thought of giving that to our pets. And I That's actually a really good point, because uh, we talk about all these things being toxic to dogs. And yeah, some things are definitely obviously more immediately toxic to dogs than they are to humans, but for some reason, yeah, we treat them like our garbage disposals. It's, it's sad, it really is. More paleoanthropologists believe the advent of cooking was the biggest influence on human evolution. Well, let's see the word believe, that's an opinion. And by the way, it is a huge influence. Whether it's the biggest or not, that's up for debate. But it did probably allow us to eat, yeah, it says, it says and ate starchy food. The problem that I have is that the starchiness or the starch level of food started to increase markedly when we started to hybridize plants, which was during the agricultural revolution. How many starchy tubers and vegetables existed with, let's say, the amount of starch as a normal sweet potato does today? Back then, when we discovered fire, I have a hard time believing that there were that many at all, if any at all, actually. But once again, and we are getting into speculation. And so therefore, since a lot of this is speculation, these people have just as much evidence to believe their point is true as I have to believe my point is true. When you talk about the speculative stuff, when you talk about the isotope analyses, that's just unequivocal. That's chemical anthropology. It's Professor Alice Roberts, whose fantastic book on evolution is right behind me. Cooking means that we get a lot more energy from our diet than we would do otherwise. Well, you don't get energy from your diet, but okay, anyway. Pedantic me again. You don't get energy from your diet, really. You yield potential energy, chemical potential energy from ATP synthase activity, and you yield caloric energy, so kinetic energy, as a result of exothermic biochemical reactions occurring in the body, but your body doesn't use that. That's released to entropy. That's what gives us body heat. But anyway. Durangham's idea is that cooking provides us with almost the same kind of boost as people used to put forward for the man the hunter idea that, that meat would be the kind of thing which gave us a lot more energy. I think it's a great theory. So now instead of the idea of man the hunter going off and catching meat, he's there but perhaps he's only bringing back the occasional rabbit. What we've got are, are, are women bringing in tubers um, and this idea of cooking and all this extra energy that cooking is giving us. Okay, so this is all theory. This is all speculation. I think it's a great theory. There is no evidence that this is actually the case because when you look at stable nitrogen and carbon isotope analyses, we see that, that is not the case when it comes to ancestral remains that are derived from, well, 900,000 to 1 million years ago, or at least ones that lived that long ago. Okay, it's an interesting theory. Cool theory. By the way, I have no, there's no ill feelings towards this woman here. Okay, cooking was revolutionary. That's fantastic. So what? mean that we could support bigger families and all of that sort of thing but perhaps it also gives us the energy to help a bit of us grow because the other big thing that's happening is an expanding brain remember when anthony said we shouldn't be going by studies we should go back to first principles the thing is sure yeah again first principles isn't a very good way of putting it i think with all due respect to anthony chavy for not actually being an arrogant carnivore influencer because there's many of those actually and for you know going against the grain which in today's society is is not easy with the overbearing influences but what i usually say is the hard sciences hard sciences you can establish cause and effect relationships or you can establish there's there's hard evidence of something okay with inferential statistics that's not hard evidence which is all that human nutrition science is and in fact it's actually even worse because you can't even perform experiments on, on human beings in human nutrition science. They try and establish what diet is indicated for human beings in human nutrition science. Inferential statistics that are done to find associations in human beings, that's actually more voracious because they're not trying to make causal inferences. It's like a psychoanalytic theory, for example. They use the science, but it's more responsibly conveyed and done. Anyway. This first principle is based on Mickey Bendor's studies. You may dismiss the Harvard Women's Health Study as Anthony did because it's observational. But yes, and all of them are. They're observational, and also they're usually poorly conducted anyway. Small sample sizes, so the signal-to-noise ratio is all over the place. The demographic is crazy. So basically, the results of said studies can only be extrapolated to the people studied, the demographic studied, the people studied. Like, for example, uh, your risk of this disease goes up by 30% if you eat this. First of all, there's so many problems with a claim like that, but also, whose risk? Mine? Was I in the study? No? Well, then get out of here. Bendor's studies are also observational. But instead of having all the information the women's health study has, like age at death and medical information, Mickey has mainly scattered bone fragments and teeth. 
Okay, so great way of framing that. Great way of framing that. Very manipulative and very beguiling. We just covered that no matter how much you have in an observational study, it's called observational because it's observational. Okay, there are associations and the associations, especially if you're referring to epidemiology, are vapid and weightless, actually. Why with epidemiology? Well, usually results are adjusted for at the end of epidemiological studies, which means that the results were fabricated because scientists report what they observe, not what they think they would have observed if they had done the study differently in an ideal world where they could have exerted complete control over human beings, over their subjects. That's one thing. That's a great one. And then also the reporting of relative outcome statistics as opposed to absolute outcome statistics, which when converting the relative outcome statistics in epidemiological studies in the results into absolute outcomes, the difference is much less than nothing at all between the populations. It's in the tenths or hundredths of thousandths of chances of death per person per year of follow-up. Now you multiply that over a hundred years for a hundred year lifespan, for example, and the utility is once again much less than nothing at all of those results. With this, oh yeah, they're all scattered bone fragments. Okay. When you measure the isotope ratios in the collagen of the long bones of ancient human remains using mass spectroscopy, sir, Chris, that is hard evidence of the protein content that we were consuming. I'll show a paper up on the screen right now that I've read in full. Humans seem to be hypercarnivores, and that was our diet, basically. The inference that we make from paleoanthropology are far better inferences than this nonsense human nutrition science. Science. Instead of basing the first principle on respected career scientists who actually do physical studies, he's basing it on a former business executive, a minor voice in paleoanthropology, who got his PhD in archaeology at age 58 and who- So? To all of that, so? Does that change the veracity of his claims in any way? Because this is a subtle, tacit appeal to authority here. You are appealing to experience, which is a responsible appeal. However, just because someone has experience in a laboratory doesn't mean they're not a trained monkey, by the way. I'm not saying this woman is, but I'm just saying that you also have to look at the type of experience they had. We live in a dismal world today, so you need to be cynical. You have to be. Search mainly also, being cynical is not being annoying per se. It's actually called thinking like a scientist, trying to disprove a hypothesis with everything you got. Just another point to throw out there. I'm a computer with an internet connection. So I think Dr. Unger's point cares. So what? The day we spread around. Okay, that's an opinion. Not because we're herbivores or carnivores, but because we can eat almost anything. Anthony's principle number two is plants are trying to kill us. So this is the study from Professor Bruce Ames. So plants are not out to kill us. They're out to protect themselves and discourage predatory imposition. We are a predator because basically a predator in the perception of a plant perception is anything that interferes with the survival of that organism of itself and its offspring. They produce defense chemicals to discourage the predators from consuming them. Now there is a quantum size difference between us and insects, insects being the primary predator of plants. So do they have the same immediate effect on us with respect to their toxicity? No, absolutely not. Some of them do, though, actually. Some of them will kill us. A lot of them. But due to human hybridization and intervention, we have produced lots of plants, new ones completely as well, like I just said in the beginning, but we've inoculated them to the best of our abilities. Not completely, though, because even if we were to remove all the plant toxins from them, the anti-nutrients, we also simultaneously have made those plants far more carbohydrate-rich. And I'm not just talking about fiber, which is also a contraindication from all of the inferences we have, but also the ones that are readily broken down into glucose and fructose and sucrose and sorbitol and lactose and galactose and all that. Harmful. Above a physiological concentration within the bloodstream. Unequivocally, unambiguously correct. In Berkeley, this was published in 1989, and he showed that just the natural plants and vegetables contain 10,000 times more naturally occurring pesticides by weight than the industrial pesticides that we were using on them. That's not actually a study by Bruce Ames. It's an article written by the staff of a pop science magazine that quoted Dr. Ames out of context. He has over 550 publications in the most respected journals for all to see. He testified to Congress about what his papers say, that the lowest quartile of fruit and vegetable consumers have double the risk of most cancers compared to people in the upper quartile. Not risk, I already covered that in the beginning, so we'll be frugal here. I mentioned that in my previous episode and beef lovers descended on the episode and mass. It has 1,800 comments. But I couldn't find a single comment pushing back on Dr. Ames's claims, nor a single mention of cancer. Tragically, as I struggled to make sense of that, a wonderful friend lost his three-year battle with cancer at 40, reminding Tony and I how devastating cancer can be. I don't know. Maybe people are just tired of hearing about fruit and vegetables and know that even they are not a guarantee against cancer. 
glucose. Well, if anything, we know that cancerous cells depend on glucose for ATP production through anaerobic glycolysis because of the fact that cancerous cells invariably necessarily have dysfunctional mitochondria within them and beta oxidation or fatty acid oxidation, the process by which the cell concerned can use fat to create ATP or energy is an exclusively mitochondrial process. Where do you get carbohydrates from? Yes, you get them from dairy. And yes, there are some sources of meat that have carbohydrates in them. Some organs, which we discourage anyway, typically. Exclude dairy, which is also a contraindication in the human diet. Unfortunately, it's addictive and it's very good. Yum, 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 yum. Okay, great. But it's not indicated. Where do you find carbohydrates typically? You find them in plants. It makes sense if you look at their cellular respiration as to why you would find them in there. Anyway. What about plant sources of the nation's obsession? Protein like nuts and legumes. This is why I don't think it's a good idea to simply ignore studies like the Nurses' Health Study. Well, that's an opinion. I think it is totally fine to ignore such a study because it is observational. And if you want to know more about why observational science means, frankly, I would recommend reading chapter one of my book, Contraindicated. Once again, link in the description below. Edition one. I am currently working on a second edition, which will be much better formatted. Just for context, I went through a formatter, a publisher that was a, it was a ghost writing club. It's actually exactly what their name was, based in LA, and they suck. In fact, they're scammers. So, yes, I was exploited. We were tricked. Recently just got Adobe InDesign, and I can do it all myself. So, I will be releasing the second edition after my first edition has been out for a year, but there is still good information contained within that that book, go ahead and buy it. I recommend the physical copies, even though I get more money from the sales of the ebook. Far better formatted in the physical copies. I would recommend doing that. Anthony encouraged. Instead of betting our health on what we can infer from million-year-old fossil fragments, this study involved 50... Once again, the way that you're phrasing it is manipulative in order to beguile people into thinking that, that is less voracious information, despite the fact that it is one of the only areas where you can establish chemical fact, an absolute fact in terms of what ancient remains were eating thousand modern humans in our modern environment with our modern foods with modern blood and cognitive tests who cares blood tests do not confer health upon someone or establish if someone is healthy healthy being basically a characteristic of someone that exhibits an absence of disease process okay not necessarily people who live long enough to get diseases like alzheimer's we have very detailed and verified dietary records for them over 30 years it's a massive effort. Verified. This doesn't mean anything. A boatload of garbage information is a boatload of garbage information. Quantity does not confer quality, Chris. Fallacy. All of this has been fallacy after fallacy. Begging the question fallacy, appeal to authority fallacy, appeal to consensus fallacy, appeal to wh whatever the opposite of appeal to tradition is, because he's talking about the modern day life, it's better to whatever. That's sort of a reach. And then appeal to quantity? That's not a real thing. I made it up. But still, this is, this is a fallacy that just because something, there's a lot of something doesn't mean that it means more. Fallacy. So if someone can cite that fallacy, if it has been established, please go ahead and do that. Collect and analyze data like this. Here are their sources of animal protein. It includes fish, which is thought to be healthy. And here are their sources of plant protein. Not many nuts and legumes here, which are thought to be healthy. Lots of other thought to be. That was responsible. And what is the point of this? Categories look like they could be pretty unhealthy, like baked goods. And we know what most American bread is like. It takes me days of study to mostly understand a study like this, and I often have to interview the lead author to fill the gaps in my understanding, which I have done many times with other studies. But I promised you wouldn't need much science to understand Anthony's first principles. And we are in luck, because Simon Hill did a great job of explaining this study, which I'll link in the description. Here are the highlights. Healthy aging was what's called a composite outcome, made up of four individual outcomes. Number one, being free. So it's a construct, okay. Free from 11 major chronic diseases. What do you mean by major chronic diseases? What is the criteria for major? What is the criteria for chronic? What is the criteria for disease? That one's easier, but the other two? 11 major chronic diseases. Number two, having no impairment in memory. Measured by what? Three, no impairment in physical function. Measured by what? And number four, being in good mental health. They also went a step. Which means what? These are all opinions further and did a substitution analysis, 
which looked at what happens when you replace 3% of calories from total protein. So this is already based on a fallacy. Because the human body doesn't absorb calories. You don't yield calories from your food that you can actually use. You yield some calories in the form of entropic release of energy from exothermic biochemical reactions, creating body heat. Okay, the body doesn't encapsulate a lot of that energy. In fact, it encapsulates the minority of it, about 30%. Our body is extremely inefficient. It encapsulates some of it in ADP and PI to form ATP. Thus, it is transformed into kinetic energy into potential chemical energy. Energy. But why does this matter? Why does this matter? Because when you actually assess food intake, if you use mass instead of caloric units, you get different outcomes. 3% of calories. What were they actually replacing though? What were they replacing? And what was the mass quantity of that? I mean, this is also a relative term. 3%. Like, uh, anyway, specificity is important in these analyses and studies. Protein, dairy protein, or plant protein with other nutrients. The real story is what you see in forest plot D in this figure. Replacing 3% of energy from animal protein with plant protein improves someone's odds of healthy aging. False. Whatever you're going to say, false. Because you already said a false claim. Improve, cause and effect statement covered that. In order to establish a cause and effect relationship in human nutrition science, you have to take two genetically identical twins, both phenotypically and genotypically identical, separate them at birth, put them into two metabolic ward lock-in rooms, observe them over their entire lives if attempting to infer lifelong health outcomes, 40 years for 40 year long health outcomes, etc., and control for every single variable, including the time they wake up, the time they go to bed, their stress levels, their hormone levels, the time they eat, etc, etc. It's implausible for obvious reasons. It also would not get passed an ethics committee, rightfully so, and also is exorbitantly expensive. You can't do it. Multiple confounders here, absolutely ridiculous. All of this is based on constructs as well, surveys, people lie as well, people forget. Respondent data. 38% and replacing 3% of energy. That's also a relative outcome statistic anyway. What were the absolute outcomes? 38%? I just talked about relative outcome statistics versus absolute outcome statistics. What was the absolute significance here? And I don't mean significance as in statistical significance. I mean the colloquial everyday modern term for significance. Dairy protein with plant protein improves someone's odds of healthy aging by 26%. The shot false covered that, didn't I? About those numbers is they were for only substituting 3% of calories. No, but they didn't replace calories, okay? In fact, when you see a calorie number on food labels, just understand that that's not even the amount of calories in that food. That food has zero calories in it. That's how many calories, plus or minus 20% in either direction, because they have to estimate this, they can't measure it, would be yielded from that food if you rapidly combusted it in a bomb calorimeter, a closed thermodynamic system, with the theory being that that's what the body does with food, when it doesn't. It's all chemistry in our bodies, not combustion. Talking about having to go big or go home. And they'd probably be better if the plant protein was coming more from beans and nuts and less from baked goods. Well, that's an opinion. I'm in charge of the program for TEDx Boston's Longevity Day on October 1st this year, and I'm on the hunt for great speakers. Turns out there are great directories of longevity studies, and I've been chasing them all down. I get fascinated by studies I hadn't heard of, like the Kyoto Centenarian study, but it feels like their conclusions are always the same. Uh, Kyoto World Economic Forum. No comment. Was ranked fourth for men and third for women. Uh, it is famous for Kyotango Longevity Cohort Research. This is okay, so a prospective cohort study that you are citing or multiple, so even worse. Epidemiology is garbage. Okay, adjustment of results, already covered that. Publication bias, by the way. Epidemiologists are unable to publish studies in epidemiological journals that disprove their hypothesis within them. First of all, respondent data, relative outcome statistics, as opposed to absolute outcome statistics. The results of said studies cannot be extrapolated to any group not studied, and they're usually done on very aged populations in order to ensure the occurrence of deaths within said studies. So, nope, this is garbage. This doesn't prove anything. Conducted by Kyoto Prefectural University of Medicine. So there are three factors that they discovered. One is a traditional diet is maintained. Yeah, like seafood, high fiber diet. Two, young vascular age. This is mainly to do with high amount of physical activity. What kind? Because that matters in terms of vascular health, by the way. But anyway, I'm being a little trivially pedantic now. Fine. And then three, community communication. Uh, they have many friends and social activities. Yeah, they eat a lot of seaweed and... Okay, so selectively chosen associative factors in the studies. Fine, cool, great. Important to address there, though. 
From what I can tell, the pattern is the healthiest populations are usually located in mild climates where there are a variety of plants to eat your rice. So what? I just covered that this was an association. Yes, what you are saying is that all of these prospective cohort studies, when you start assessing longevity, basically, have three primary factors in common. They eat a lot of seafood and a lot of plants, purportedly, by the way, because when you look at Okinawa, Japan, which is a very trite example, but it is trite for a reason, they actually eat a lot of pork, and they're also a blue zone, so that completely undermines this whole cause and effect claim that you need to have these three factors that are selectively chosen in order to effectuate longevity and guarantee it rather. They have good vascular age, which is a construct, by the way. I didn't even mention that. What do you mean vascular age? How is that inferred? How is that derived? What markers are used for that? It's a construct. It's an opinion. Okay. And then finally, social communication. Great. So they all have that. So what? Who cares? If anything, this sort of tends to undermine this reductionist view that it's the diet because there's other factors in play. You can opine that the diet would be the most significant one, but that's an opinion and no science can actually underpin that claim causally. In my opinion, diet probably does play a role. Let's look at the diet and see what's what's different compared to the standard American one in the United States that we all consume. And also in Europe as well, because it's not exclusive to America anymore. Hasn't been for a long time. And often where there are fish. France is a pretty good example. If you looked at the north of Brittany, Normandy, uh, parts of France, they were really northern Europeans that had very dairy-centric diets. And then the south of France had more Mediterranean type diets, they were really up. Define that. Again, we'll be forgiving, fine. But that's a question I would ask, that I would pose here. At least he said diets plural and didn't say the Mediterranean diet as if there's only one. Mediterranean. And across though, just within France, there was also a fourfold difference in heart disease rates with the uh, a dairy animal centric diet at the north having about four times higher risk of heart disease. Nope, not higher risk. False. It's an association. Man, I almost said that, but I wanted to let him keep talking. Probably shouldn't have let him do that, though. Maybe I should stop doing that. Not risk. It's an association. The word risk is a cause and effect claim. Compared to the Mediterranean. Here's another of Anthony's first principles. If a diet is lacking in specific essential nutrients like B12, but there are more then that cannot be our evolved biologically appropriate diet. Okay, a few claims here, a few things to add. There are other factors at play here. For example, the vegan vegetarian argument says, well, our plants nowadays are growing in more destitute soil in terms of their nutrients, which is true. And so when you say something like, well, the diet cannot be our optimal diet because it doesn't have everything we need, that completely excludes or fails to mention the fact that our soil is just becoming more depleted. And that's probably, that has a role to play. Here's a good rebuttal. Well, what about carnitine? And and choline and creatine. Okay, those are only found in animal products. Now you have to play devil's advocate. One could say, well, our body makes a lot of those itself. It makes everything that it needs to survive, which is true. So then you have to say, okay, well, when it comes to living optimally versus just surviving, is it your opinion that a vegetarian diet is made for that? And if it is, then go ahead. That's your opinion, but you cannot prove that it is the case. And I can't prove that mine is the case when it comes to having a carnivore diet be the preferred diet, at least that I promulgate that I advocate for based on this logic alone. There we go, we're done. See how easy that was? Number two though, since there are other factors at play, it's directly related to the first one. You can take, for example, electrolytes as a factor here. Well, what do you have to say about the carnivores that take electrolytes? And then there's arguments to make. Well, we don't have blood anymore with our food. That's, that's one thing that has been posited to be the reason why some people may need to supplement with electrolytes. We live in a modern world, so we have to make some changes. But that would completely interfere with Anthony Chafee's argument, right? That's why I actually don't really I don't like giving this argument. You can obviously make the completely apparent judgment that, well, a vegan diet is far more bereft than a carnivore diet, if you were going to say that the carnivore diet is bereft with respect to electrolyte content. I don't even make that argument, though. You know what I say is, um, I don't supplement with electrolytes. What's wrong with me? Not everyone has to supplement with electrolytes. So there you go. And also when it comes to a vegan diet and its destitution, when people say, well, our body hedges against it because it creates all the things endogenously. What I like to do is I like to basically compare the anecdotes because that's basically all we got right now between carnivores and vegans. Properly tenured, properly fortified carnivore diet versus what is colloquially deemed in the vegetarian and vegan space as a properly tenured and properly fortified vegan slash vegetarian diet. That would be a lot harder to establish because they have so many different opinions as to what that means. And I'd like to compare how many negative ones versus how many positive ones there are, at least claimed. People lie. And I'd also like to compare their appearance. That's what I like to do. Again, we're dealing with opinions though, huh? See, this is the thing about science. It's not as definitive as a lot of people would like it to be, okay? You just do the best you can with what you got, so. There is some very dangerous misinformation about this and I'll touch on just some of it. 
it's absolutely correct that vegans must pay attention to B12, but it's also absolutely correct that omnivores and carnivores must pay attention to it too. There is an argument that what? that vegans must pay attention to B12, but it's also absolutely correct that omnivores and carnivores must pay attention to it too. There is an argument that- Okay, so let's go ahead and look at the case studies of people that are exhibiting vitamin B12 deficiency that are actually symptomatic, not just based on levels, but based on symptoms. They're actually B12 deficient, therefore it's interfering with the survival of that organism. If we're going to refer to humans as organisms, it's a little uh, objectifying. It's dehumanizing. And let's see what diets they were eating. Let's see what actually led them to having a B12 deficiency. Let's see how many carnivores actually exhibit that. Exclude omnivores, by the way, because I'm not advocating for an omnivore carnivorous diet, am I? Not at all. Hypercarnivorous. Less hygienic world, we got B12 from things like dirt, contamination with feces, etc. But we don't live in that world now. B12 is not in plants, except perhaps duckweed, which hardly anyone eats. Sucking on a B12 pill is dead easy and cheap. You gotta do it. It also depends on the type of B12 because there's cobalamin and there's methylcobalamin. There's methylcobalamin and then there's cyanocobalamin, sorry. Methylcobalamin is the active form. And you can overdo vitamins and minerals. Minerals especially, potassium, gotta be careful with that. Wouldn't it be great if you could just get all the vitamin B12 that you need from food? In the case of meat, for example. If you want to get it from plants and take a supplement, go ahead, fine. In my opinion, that is evincing of the fact that it is a species inappropriate diet for human beings dangerous thing is believing that because you're not vegan, you're good. Estimates vary, but well, that's not necessarily the case. I agree with that. But again, let's go ahead and look at how many people that have a vitamin B12 deficiency or have had one that has been reported in the case studies were consuming a carnivore diet or even an omnivorous diet if we're going to lump them in. But like I said, I'm not advocating for an omnivorous diet anyway. 20% of people neither are carnivores like Anthony Chafee. 60 are low in B12 no matter what they eat. What do you mean by low in B12? Are they symptomatic? Or is it below the what's deemed by the scientific fraternity and community as an appropriate level based on normative levels of the population? That population being deranged. I don't care what the normal levels are in a population because guess what? I'm not normal and neither should anyone want to be. Because it's bound to animal protein and it takes an acid stomach to absorb it. And stomach acidity declines with age. Does it necessarily have to? Guess what? It doesn't. It doesn't make any sense why it would necessarily have to. Stomach acidity is the result of pumping chloride ions into the stomach commensurate with the pumping of particularly sodium out of the stomach. The chloride ions in the solution imposes a demand on the stomach, the water in the stomach, to dissociate into a hydronium ion. Hydronium, Cl-, that's where we get hydrochloric acid from, but there's no HCl in your stomach, actually. It's all dissociated. Look at the pKa value of hydrochloric acid and the hydrogen is what breaks apart your food. So why is it that as you age, those enterocytes cannot pump ions in and out of the cell? That's not what seems to happen, actually. It seems to be stomach damage as a result of consuming a contraindicated diet over the course of decades and decades that causes low stomach acidity. And I wrote in my book, that low stomach acidity seems to be what a huge cause of acid reflux actually is. The pills is crystalline and you generally retain the ability to absorb that. For example, Sanjay Gupta is a neurosurgeon who wrote a great book about staying sharp. He's 54 and just went through a battery of cognitive tests, and he discovered that he was low in B12. Low meaning what? Below the normative level of the population? Was he actually symptomatic? Did he have symptoms of B12 deficiency? Okay, did his B12 level necessarily portend poor health outcomes if he didn't present with poor health at the time of testing? Check it. I made an episode about it. The second dangerous thing is believing beef is the perfect food and it contains all the nutrients you need. It does, actually. Okay. It has lower amounts of nutrients in it as one would think would be sufficient because of what we've been told. Sure. But try and find someone that actually exhibits a vitamin deficiency associated with symptoms that would result from a truly deficient level of said vitamin or mineral that are on carnivore. And then if you do find those people, which I'm sure there's some, assess the diet. Did you know that beef jerky is carnivore? Guess what is a good Good way of becoming deficient on carnivore. Eating only beef jerky. Oh, I read the same comments you do reinforcing that notion, and I've read all of your comments on my channel. And I've read the amazing turnarounds people have experienced in their health on a carnivore diet, and I believe them. Here's the thing, I have an unnatural interest in diet trends past, and I have dozens of historical books about them. 
The biggest ones that kept coming around that were based on the perfect food were the milk diet miracle, the egg diet, fruitarian, raw vegetable, all meat, all white rice diet, and juice diets. They all produced amazing stories of weight loss and transformations in people's health for a, Correct. For a while, maybe even 10 years or more with a few tragic exceptions. Oh, sort of like the vegan diet? Is that what you mean? Oh, you mean the carnivore diet. What's conspicuously absent are populations who lived long on them, even though they've trended for centuries. Maybe mainstream anthropologists got it right when they observed that we evolved on diversity. And they're gonna be seasonally variable because plants seed and fruit at different times, herds migrate, and fish spawn on a seasonal cycle. What's common among all diet trends which focus on a single superfood is how adherents form groups that focus on the positive stories and shut out the negative ones. A couple of emergency room docs asked me to raise the flag on one of the mishaps of the carnivore diet which doesn't make it into those positive groups. It's a very difficult thing to diagnose in the emergency room. Emergency room doc Siobhan makes really good episodes about difficult diagnoses, and here are clips from her episode about a carnivore named Tom who came into the emergency room experiencing anaphylactic shock. Alpha-gal is a carbohydrate that's found in all mammals except humans and higher primates. So when Tom's immune system came in contact with alpha-gal, it identified it as foreign and kind of freaked out. And here's why I think you need to know about alpha-gal syndrome. At least half a million Americans are living- What does this have anything to do with the carnivore diet? Being bad or something? Or being something to be discouraged from embarking upon? I mean, genuine question here. Okay, so people can become allergic to red meat because of a tick bite. By the way, you can still be carnivore on that diet. Go away from red meat. There are anecdotes of these people. Now, th I mean, thanks for bringing awareness to this because now if anyone starts to eat their beef and becomes anaphylactic, well, there you go. Now you, you probably know why. Okay, great, great. What does this have to do with carnivore? condition and having allergic reactions to red meat. But that number is probably a lot higher because the condition is likely underdiagnosed. For a couple of reasons. There's a huge range of severity, from a stomach ache or itchy skin a few hours after eating, to a full-blown cardiac arrest like Tom experienced. Unlike most food allergies where the reaction- Okay, so how many people that are consuming a carnivore diet eat their beef and then die of a heart attack? You want to cite this? If you're going to use this as a discouragement tactic from the carnivore diet, this is desperate. Within minutes, Alpha-gal reactions are delayed. They take two to eight hours to develop. So patients and their healthcare providers may not make the connection to red meat. And unfortunately, there are many patients that carry a misdiagnosis, like irritable bowel syndrome or chronic diarrhea before the proper diagnosis is made. Plus, the reactions can be unpredictable. A food that you might tolerate one day, you might react to the next day. Obviously, he cannot eat red meat but he actually can have fish, seafood, and poultry because they don't contain alpha-gal. There you go. Pork is another option, I believe. So what? Butter? You can have that too. about single superfood diets is in the long run, you can eventually overdose on some nutrients and become deficient in others. For example, red meat has the highest concentration of a form of iron called heme, which is a the non-toxic form of iron. Yup, it's the non-toxic form of iron, as opposed to elemental iron, the form of iron found in f***ing plants, Chris. You can't overdose on heme iron. You can't overconsume it, is really what I should be saying. It's non-toxic. ...with accelerated aging. Fish have much lower levels and plants have none. Oh, it's associated with accelerated aging. Wow. What the hell does accelerated aging even f***ing mean, first of all? But also, wow, association. Well, the association, if it's an association, can get f***ed then. If it's an association, you have nothing else to underpin that, then it can get f***ed. The most bioavailable form of iron and can generate high levels of ferritin. Wait, I'm sorry, did you say it was the most bioavailable? That's interesting. That's interesting. Hmm. Well, let's just hear him say it again. It's the most bioavailable form of iron and can generate high levels of ferritin in men and po- So what? Ferritin is a storage form of iron. Unless you were diagnosed with something that you would have been diagnosed with as an infant, that being hemochromatosis, your ferritin levels do not confer any evidence about your health with respect to iron levels. It's a storage form of iron. The only time that you'll have a problem is if your ferritin is extremely high, and you'll know that because you'll have symptoms. Heme iron, the most bioavailable form of iron, the non-toxic form, is somehow something you should avoid because it may raise your ferritin levels above the normative value of the population? Like, the, the only other time that ferritin would even be remotely a problem is if you have one of the paradoxical forms of anemia, or the forms of anemia that paradoxically lead to high ferritin levels. But you would also know about it because you'd have symptoms of anemia. You'd be anemic despite eating iron in red meat. Menopausal women. 
ferritin is an indicator of iron levels. The Copenhagen Heart Study collected ferritin levels for 9,000 people who died at different ages. People with ferritin levels less than 200 died at a median age of 79. Between 200 and 400, they lived three years less. Between 400 and 600, it was seven years less. Who gives a flying f Chris? Food for thought, maybe. I'm not going to be thinking about this this much, though. 624 years less. I am often sh Oh my god. Oh. Oh. Sorry guys. I mean, I really <laughs> I've been trying to tone it down recently, but this is really patronizing. And Chris knows it, and I've heard from one of his relatives about him, which is why I'm more comfortable talking to him like this. Well, replying to his past self in video form like this. X years less. Oh. Oh. Who gives a f Chris? Shaken by the idea that beef has no nutrient deficiencies. For example, it has low levels of carotenoids. They are the Who cares? What's the dietary requirement for carotenoids for the subserving of a human life? That protect plants from sunburn for- Oh, wow. I guess we need a lot of those, don't we? Like me, who have fair freckled Scottish skin, a reddish mustache, and blue eyes, we really depend on absorbing those dyes to protect our skin and our eyes. Oh, you think that just absorbing the things that are responsible for protecting the plants from sunlight will just do the same for you? What's your evidence for that? What is your evidence for that? Beef lacks carotenoids. That's the thing at the bottom of the screen. Who cares? You ask most people on a carnivore diet, they burn far less and far less severely as well when adopting a diet bereft completely of carotenoids. Explain that. Riddle me that, Chris. Carotenoids from colorful fruit and veggies generally add an SPF factor of 2 to skin like mine, which means it takes 20- No, that's an association, Chris. <laughs> what? And also inferred and measured by what? Depending on the time of day, that will also determine how you burn. ...is long to burn and slows aging of the skin. I made an episode- Slows aging of the skin, inferred by what? Okay, you're just saying words, Chris. That. What about fiber? When I was a well, fiber is a contraindication, if anything, in the human diet. It's definitely not required for human physiology, but it seems to cause microabrasions in the gut lining, increased mucus secretion as a result of increased immune dysregulation as a result of the microabrasions, actually. There's only been one study that even was remotely pseudoscientific, actually. It was pseudoscientific, but it was the one that was even remotely scientific, that even remotely attempted to control for confounding variables, published in the World Journal of Gastroenterology in 2012, that showed that people that presented with idiopathic constipation that were split into three groups, one group being one that basically perpetuated their fiber intake and another that removed it somewhat and the other that completely eliminated it, experienced all different kinds of changes in their idiopathic constipation after doing it for a while. But the group that completely ameliorated their idiopathic constipation and all associated symptoms, which not only included blockage but anal bleeding and bloating, was the group that completely eliminated fiber. And it was invariably the case, actually. Not one person did not ameliorate their constipation in that situation. Not one person in the group that perpetuated their fiber intake, they basically had a bowel movement of once every 6.8 three days. They had no amelioration, no alleviation in symptoms. And also the group that slightly ameliorated it, well, guess what? They also slightly reduced their symptoms. Of course, those are the confounders, because in order to reduce your fiber intake, you're replacing the fibrous foods with other foods. So you could say, well, the other foods probably played a role. Well, fine. But what I'm saying is that there's only been one study that has even remotely attempted to establish fiber's efficacy to ameliorate constipation, for example. There's also only two associative factors when it comes to diverticulosis, a, an outpouching or breaking down of the distal colon, which leads to infection and early death if left untreated, it trends towards diverticulitis, which is increased number of bowel motions per day and increased fiber intake. And if you increase your fiber intake, people typically experience the former associative factor as well. So interesting. General surgeons put patients with diverticulosis on a low fiber diet. They call it a low residue diet in order to rest the bowel. Okay, and it works. Ask anyone with a colostomy bag what gets stuck in their colostomy bag, if it's meat and animal fat or if it's plant material. Okay, we're done. You don't need fiber, and it doesn't seem to be a good idea to be consuming it. In fact, I know that whenever I have anything that's fibrous, including some sugar alcohols, I'm bloated for hours afterwards. Living with my poverty-stricken mom, whom I adored, I didn't brush my teeth, and we had no money for a dentist. The first time I saw one, he told me to start brushing. I tried, but it made my gums bleed, so I stopped. On my next visit, the dentist told me, we have a paradox. You won't brush your teeth because they bleed, and they bleed because you won't brush your teeth. I think we have the same paradox with fiber. It takes a healthy microbiome to digest fiber, but we live in- No. False. You can't digest fiber. It's indigestible. If you're talking about soluble fiber, you ferment that. And that is not the same thing as digesting it at all. ...of antibiotics overuse 
And foods like these Twinkies, which have been sitting on my counter for three years, untouched by bacteria, mold, or ants. Who gives a f Chris? Do no favors to our microbiome. And so we end up with microbiomes which can no longer break down some kinds of fiber. One of the big- You can't break down fiber because it's indigestible, Chris. Pretentious. Advances in nutrition over the last 15 years is learning that feeding our microbiomes a wide variety of fiber and fermented foods gets us a diverse microbiome that diversity is not congruous with health. Who cares if your microbiome is diverse? That doesn't mean that your microbiome is healthy and vice versa. Mine probably isn't that diverse. That doesn't mean that it's unhealthy. Your microbiome adjusts to the diet that you are on as long as you prudently transition to whatever diet you are transitioning to. It's the favor. Your gut is like a pharmacy. When the bacteria is feeding on these prebiotics, it's dispensing drug-like molecules mm -hmm. that go into your blood and affect your mood, they affect your blood glucose control, they affect your- You know what else affects your blood glucose control in a more optimal way? Optimal meaning that it's not conducive to perpetuating glycation damage in excess, uh, is not consuming carbohydrates, by the way. Anyway, let's continue. Lipids, when you have a- Okay, so, so I just caught the tail end of that. Lipids, covered lipids in my last video, actually, that I just recorded. You know what, I'll put a link to that in the top right corner of the screen, actually. Might as well. Did microbiome and you lose that capacity, you're missing out on those rewards. Okay, so improved blood lipids that you were just referring to, or at least you just said effects on blood lipids. You don't want effects on blood lipids, really. Your body knows exactly what it's supposed to do in terms of the encoding of the production of lipid proteins, and it also knows what to do with excess cholesterol. So your cholesterol levels and LDL levels and all that stuff, lipid protein levels are regulated by your genes and nothing else. You don't want to be tampering with that at all. Improvement in blood glucose levels, I already covered how to do that. And then in terms of affecting mental clarity, we'll talk to any carnivore that has actually been carnivore for even just a month or two in many cases and talk to them about how their mood feels as a result of shifting over to a carnivore diet from either a vegan diet, a vegetarian diet, or a standard American diet. Okay, also talk to them about how their gut feels after removing fiber. That's a good one. ...of carnivores have proven you can thrive for a number of years without fiber. The question is for- You can thrive forever without fiber. Well, of course not forever, because we all die. But by the way, if you want to know why I'm being extremely defensive and pedantic, like whenever I say anything and I always like cover up everything, it's because I am prepared for them to exploit my claims. All of them. I'm always prepared. It's called playing devil's advocate in the back of my brain every time I say something. Well, the majority of the time I say something. See? Look at that. Many years, the dangerous thing is when some bacterial species disappear in our microbiome, they're not coming back. Not for you or your children if you're a mother. And that may impair your digestion and your children's digestion. Is there any evidence of the fact that they won't? And if there is, we still know that the gut microbiome will adapt to whatever diet you're on. Once again, just transition prudently and sensibly. And then it will do so without any issues. How about you go ahead and do that? So, frankly, this is, I just don't care. I don't care about this. This is not science. Forever. I made an episode about that. Okay, maybe poop transplants from someone who didn't wreck their microbiome can bring back some bacterial species. Hmm, I'm picking up tones of bifidobacteria, which is known to ferment fire. Really? Boost immune response and reduce inflammation. I know many- No, it's not known to do any such thing, actually, if that's what you just said. Sorry, I'm already tuning out. It was maybe associated with those outcomes in prospective cohort studies, also being epidemiological studies done on very aged populations, which showed that people that lived longer typically presented with certain gut microbiota. It's called reductionism. Chris, is it really this hard to understand? Association does not equal causation. Groundbreaking, isn't it? Have intolerances to plants, perhaps because of a wrecked microbiome, an allergy, or whatever. When that happens with animal foods, no one says they're intolerant to animals. They figure out if it's shellfish or dairy or whatever with an elimination diet. With plants, it could be nightshade vegetables, modern wheat, peanuts, or whatever. But I don't think... How about we acknowledge the fact that 99% of plants in the world pretty much will kill you upon consumption, but 99% of animal products won't. So when you're talking about these adverse reactions, it's almost always a plant allergy and not a meat allergy, unless you're talking about shellfish, which we weren't really evolved to eat that much of anyway. What a shock. Jumping to a conclusion that it's all plants is a recipe for longevity. 
My wish is for people to consult someone like Brooke Goldner or Will Bolsowitz before making a really... Will Bolsowitz? Really? I've done three videos, I think, on him. They're all Patreon exclusives because I didn't think he was worth putting publicly on the channel. You want to watch those, please subscribe to the Patreon. Linked below. ...sequential decision to eliminate all plants. There are many other nutrients. Well, let's just say that you're right and you lose all those gut bacteria, which means that whenever you go back to eating fiber, since they'll never grow back, you'll always have a problem digesting fiber. Well, great. Well, then I'm not going back to plants then because I know that they'll bother me. Just continue eating the meat then, huh? Guess I have no other choice then, Chris. Efficiencies in beef like folate and polyphenols but this episode... There's no such thing as a polyphenol requirement for human beings. If anything, they can induce harm, like resveratrol and curcumin, the latter of which particularly in the gastric mucosa. They have the ability to do such a thing. They're not required. Why consume them? There are no established benefits of consuming those things. And let's say that there were. Let's say that there were, because some plants, that obviously, we've been using plants medicinally for millennia. Does that mean that you should be eating them to get those benefits? No, it means you should use them medicinally. Last I checked, I don't eat ibuprofen with my meal. I take it probably once a year if I need to. It's a pretty innocuous drug compared to others. Fun fact. Chris, this is abysmal. Is this the quality of Chris's videos, by the way? Because, by the way, if you notice when watching Chris's videos, there's a reason. There's very, there's a very clear reason why he has extremely good reviews on his channel and an extremely high subscriber count. At least compared to me. I say extremely. Of course, Anthony Chafee has more, like he was just saying. Do you see the quality of the videos? Audio quality, the visual quality. It's amazing. On top of the fact that his presentation, he's very clearly a good public speaker. Well, guess what? I am too. So I can make a video like that as well. It doesn't make me right. What makes me right is the fact that all of my claims are based on hard science and also the discipline that I employ when it comes to assessing science. I don't do it myself yet. One day, that's the goal. Anyway, Chris, you should make a video on me next. A response to my response. Challenge. Don't misrepresent or strategically cut my video to manipulate people into thinking I said something I didn't. Impossible too long, so maybe I should return to first principles. I think every paleontologist, including Mickey Bendor, agrees that we evolved eating a variety of wild animals and wild fish, including all the parts. Even it's actually ruminant animal meat primarily. Mammoths was actually the, the most prevalent one right next to reindeer. Historical diet books say fattened, sedentary animals raised in fenced pastures or barns were not the natural diet of man. And not who cares? They are the closest to what we have been evolved to eat. Also, also, what is the difference between a wild animal and one that is domesticated eating their species appropriate diet? The activity level? Well, how does the activity level of the animal affect the nutrition that we derive from it? Desperate reach. Again. Healthy is eating wild animals. Wild boar and wild sow. The reason teacheth us that it is far above tame pork or swine's flesh, first, because it feeds more purely, secondly, because it hath not meat brought to hand, but gets it by travail, and hath choice of diet to feed whereon it liveth. Okay, so this is just theology, isn't it? That's exactly what this is. This is opinion. <laughs> it is not penned up as commonly our swine. Part two. So how does someone like Anthony come to believe the very opposite of someone like Bruce Ames? That question got me rereading Carl Sagan's famous book, The Demon Haunted World, Science as a Candle in the Dark. Sagan was contending with a million UFO sightings. Some people described actually boarding UFOs. Dr. Sagan couldn't say for sure there are no aliens, so how should he have answered? Neil deGrasse Tyson took a stab at that answer in our more modern world. Why is it that our best images of these visiting aliens are fuzzy? When we have six billion smartphones in the world. How come we're not hearing about alien abductions anymore the way we used to? Right, in the 70s, 60s, 70s, early 80s, alien abduction stories were common, where people would get brought onto this craft get poked and prodded. Now, you don't want to discount someone's feelings or, or emotional encounter that they might have had, but we, I just need better evidence than your eyewitness testimony. Like eyewitness testimony, as high as that is in the court of law, where they say, I need a witness. In the court of science, it's like, no, <laughs> show me the data. So that would be a camera. So today, if an alien starts walking toward George, you pull out the camera and stream it. Alien abduction stories have gone basically to zero in modern times relative to back then. Because of the phones. The phones. Right.
what I took away from Dr. Sagan's book is one, it's so very hard not to believe what you really want to believe. And two, social proof is a very powerful thing. Are there signs that Anthony just really wants to believe? And no one like if that is the case who cares you still have yet to disprove his claims you didn't disprove his claims in this video at all these are all opinions okay if you're trying to figure out why someone holds a different opinion than you i mean then this has not this really has nothing to do with the title of the video does it i don't care about it there's multiple reasons we're done you hold your opinion that a plant-based diet is superior i hold my opinion that that's silly and inane and absolutely flies in the face of hard science that we absolutely do have and can't establish hard facts with i choose to be carnivore and i choose to advocate for it and promote it we're done sprouts right you know you, you give an infant a base piece of broccoli they will hate you for it you know you give them a piece of bacon you know and their eyes light up what a that's weaker yes he's being facetious it's called being humorous to captivate an audience okay you know that chris because you're a public speaker which makes this even worse that you just put that up and exploited that part of the clip because you know why he's doing it it's intellectual dishonesty being a pop science article that's only a three minute read and wanting to believe so hard you don't actually follow up and read what Bruce Ames actually wrote. Didn't we cover this in the beginning? Where just because Bruce Ames's conclusion was not agreed with by Anthony Chafee, that doesn't mean that Anthony Chafee can take things from him that he said and prove it to be true and use it to bolster his argument and his claims? I have an Italian wife and she feeds me a wonderful Mediterranean diet. We eat lots of fish and veggies and I love Italians cook veggies in wonderful ways with a little olive oil and garlic and so now we got Rhonda Patrick on the right we got Rhonda Patrick reductionist Rhonda I've done a video on her before she makes the same f mistakes as this man Christopher she's a PhD in biochemistry I believe which is it, it's it's really sad because if she truly understood biochemistry then she'd understand what diet is appropriate for human beings and the most indicated to consume and if she understood the other sciences at least to some degree so I don't eat veggies with a meal and feel deprived. What okay, so fine. So it works for him. Great. So he, he decides to do that. Does that mean he's right? Okay, so what are you doing? This is all fallacious. You're just using a bunch of argumentative fallacies. I mean, I'm, I'm starting I'm starting to even wonder if you're arguing anything at all. I don't understand what you're doing. Are you arguing anything? All you're sitting here doing now is why do some people hold opinions that differ from mine? Huh? Coming on to the one paleoanthropologist who believes we evolved eating giant wild animals almost exclusively and ignoring other paleoanthropologists. I wanted to understand more if I could. So well, now you just implied that that was only opinionated and speculative when we have evidence of this. Mammoths, Chris. Stable isotope analyses. Up listening to Dan Ariely's book, Misbelief. What makes rational people believe irrational things? Chapter one, how could that person believe that thing? That is a riveting book. He described the risk factors we all have that entice us down the funnel of misbelief. One is stress. Maybe we have a scary condition that doctors haven't been able to diagnose. Could it be from a vaccine, pesticides, oxalates? The experts are not sure, but we find people who say they are sure and they have social proof to back it up. They accept us, they give us respect, even when our families are beginning to withdraw because they suspect we're starting to lose our minds. And so, according to Dan Ariely, the number one driver of our belief becomes social. Narcissism is a risk factor and we probably all have some of that. Stress and narcissism create a dangerous mix. Tend to your narcissists. Give them a little extra love, affirmation, or just give them a hug. Oh, honey, can I just give you a hug? You look like you need one today. So the people not sliding down the funnel of misbelief often inadvertently harden the beliefs of those who are. That's because presenting facts, which seem so persuasive to them, can come across as criticism. And the common reaction to facts we don't like is to double down on social proof, which is so persuasive. Woman's world knows how powerful social proof is. For example, in their edition about the carb that cures cravings, AKA the potato is a superfood diet, they put Patty Harding on the cover who lost 100 pounds at age 69 and transformed her health. Yes, she's a real person who goes by the name of Potato Patty. The author of this 1906 book, The Royal Road to Health, had to contend with the war that was going on between vegetarians and carnivores in his day. He said that war had raged since the days of Pythagoras. 
each side can point to exceptional instances of physical development under the different diets. And each can point to ill results that follow rigid adherence to one diet or the other. Can they, when it comes to carnivores? Can you point to evidence of that? Because you haven't done it yet, Chris. Okay. And also, just because there's potential for someone to respond adversely to a dietary change doesn't necessarily mean it was the diet, first of all, but also doesn't inherently mean, even if it was due to the diet directly, that the diet itself is contraindicated. I said no commenters reacted to Bruce Ames or cancer after I pointed out what he actually said. Instead, they doubled down. I already just pointed out that what he said didn't make him right social proof and on feeling attacked by me. But the biggest risk factor of all is trust. If we can be persuaded that we've been lied to by doctors and scientists, it's way more likely we'll go down the funnels of disbelief. Steve Jobs used to say, you can tell a lot about a person by the heroes they keep. I think you can predict a lot about what a person believes by who they trust. If you mostly trust scientists at institutions like Harvard and Stanford, you're likely to believe whole plants close to their natural state are healthy. Yep, and that is also going to be likely that you trust them if you have no idea how science is actually done and if you've been taught something wrong. Basically what you're doing here, Chris, is you're using an appeal to consensus fallacy again. Appeal to authority and appeal to consensus. All of these things can be proven false, okay? Risk, no. Every time that you said risk, that can be proven wrong. Wow. And yes, just to make a comment here, I'm trying to get the video rolling through because this is long, okay? We have seven more minutes left. You are right in saying that if you can convince people that they have been lied to, then they'll even more so agree with their, with their take. But the way that you framed it makes it seem like the convincing was propagandistic lying itself. No, there's proof of lying. The Journal of the American Medical Association published a report in 2015 that showed internal documentation from the Sugar Research Foundation showing in their own words and documentation how they paid off three Harvard professors to make it seem like cholesterol and saturated fat were causing heart disease while sugar was exonerated. They discussed how there was quite a substantial amount of evidence that suggested that sugar is probably what causes heart disease, not cholesterol and unsaturated fat. We have been lied to by institutions. So instead of blaming us for believing in what we believe in, which you seem to be really vexed by for some reason, maybe a little bit of narcissism, by the way, Chris, maybe you can't fathom the fact that other people live differently from you and therefore you feign this magnanimity, which is very clearly patronizing and pretentious as f by the way, because frankly, I don't care that you eat a plant-based diet. Go for it. Do it. Anyway, yes, people will tend to hold on to their beliefs if they believe that the other beliefs that they were holding were derived from people that lied to them. Congratulations. So what? You don't understandably. So, so how does this prove that the carnivore diet is is dangerous or or bad in some way? Anything goes. I say understandably because I have worked across many scientific fields. And if corporations and politicians have an incentive to discredit scientists in a certain field, they generally succeed among maybe half the population. And that amplifies the spiral of misbelief. For example, suppose you believe leading doctors and scientists are liars, as Anthony does. Well, he has the authority to say that, doesn't he? Because he's actually worked with other doctors and he's heard what they have to say. And also, we have the authority to say it because we can establish unequivocally, as free thinkers in this world, some of us, that there are lies that they are promulgating. And there are financial ties, there's incentives for them to lie. And prescribe drugs as well, by the way, side note. Anyway. Okay, the American Heart Association is a pack of lying somethings. Understandably, you're not going to read studies from people you believe are liars, which stalls many. I do. Well, I don't really read any of those observational studies at all, unless I have to, when it's put in front of my face and I can usually eviscerate it immediately, which I've done on multiple occasions on this channel. You should binge it, Chris, learn something. But for example, I'm not going to completely write off a study if there is financial interest in the authors. I, I, I really won't. All I want to look at is how the study was done, because even if you're funded, you still can't fake and feign positive results by doing the study appropriately. You still couldn't do that. Turns out that every single one of these funded studies, well, they were instructed to do things a little differently. That's what makes the results fallacious and erroneous, or at least the reporting of the results, especially, rather. Intention debates because one person hasn't read the studies and the other has. You're asking me to do something that I'm not prepared for, and so obviously that's not that's not something that I can I can do in a in a well-reasoned way. Part three, how do we pick the people that we trust? By now you're thinking, well, that's easy. We pick people who tell us what we want to hear, that scientists got it all wrong, and who provide social proof. But there are darker things to talk about. Here's one. Humans have always loved villains. Without them, the entire canon of our storytelling would be very dull indeed. A good villain helps us draw bright moral lines. 
create drama and tension, and find a satisfying resolution when evil is defeated. Okay, so what your point is, is that we create villains out of nothing in order to basically establish a perpetuated presence of conflict, because despite how much humans complain about conflict, we would be nothing without it. In fact, actually, it's sort of paradoxical, because without conflict, that in and of itself would be conflict, right? So anyway, how does this disprove the fact that actually there are villains in the story, still? liars in this case. It doesn't just prove the fact that they are liars. So what you're doing is you're trying to imply that since we're making a villain out of someone or something, institutions, these, these multiple institutions, that it's because we like the idea of creating villains to perpetuate a sense of conflict and therefore give us meaning. That's what you're doing. It's silly. It's f silly and desperate, Chris. I think this is a major tell. Making things up about leading scientists and doctors to cast them as villains. So did we make it up? Did I make up what I just said about the Journal of the American Medical Association publishing the report from the UCSF showing internal documentation of the Sugar Research Foundation? Internal fraud, basically. Did I make that up? Is that made up right there? Very powerful way to become a star and send people down the funnel of misbelief. When a person expresses moral outrage, they elevate their own status from that of a hater to that of a righteous crusader for justice and morality. When we see someone expressing themselves with moral outrage, it's a sign that they've gone quite deep into the funnel. The most polarizing figure in all of nutrition is Ansel Keys. Well, that's an opinion, actually, but okay, that's a, he's a very, very good contender for that position, and rightfully so, because he's a liar. Popularized the Mediterranean diet. Scientists who have studied him think he was a giant, the best in the history of nutrition. I have Yes, the man who wasn't even fully a physiologist yet, and biologist, he was still studying when he was selected to determine the cause of heart disease by the Eisenhower administration. Also the man who wasn't a human physiologist or biologist, but a fish one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the man that, once again, as trite as it is, published, I don't know, his findings in seven different countries whenever he actually had findings in 23 different countries for the association, the purported association between increased saturated fat intake and increased heart disease prevalence. Good him and the people who revile him for years, and there is a very sharp line that separates the two. All the people I have ever heard of who think he was great actually read what he wrote. I have never- Wow. Wow. Also the man who moved, he migrated from the United States to an area in the Mediterranean, I believe. I have no idea where. And went against everything he said. He lived quite a while by eating a lot of fat. The very thing that he said you shouldn't be consuming. I believe it was saturated fat. Ansel Keys was a fraud, Chris one of his critics who actually read what he wrote like this 1980 book still available from harvard university press since consumers have not read ansel keys's papers a professional writer who understands the power of moral outrage could tell a consumer audience this keys did a lot of you know there's hardly a better word for it than kind of saying fudging the data and he published it in obscure german only journals, I had to go back to obscure places. He really didn't want this data to get out. None of that is true, but morally, the most outrageous thing a scientist can do is fudge their data and try to hide it. The thing is, the currency of credible scientists is evidence. They don't deal in villains, moral outrage, and social proof. But many social media stars do, and that explains a lot about how they get... Yes, they use emotional appeal to entice people into listening to them. That doesn't mean their entire argument is based upon emotional appeal, Chris. It's based upon fact. For example, if you watch my channel, you'll understand the facts if you actually listen with an open mind like you pretend to do in your videos, Chris. Views. I know some people watching right now are angry that Ansel Keys cherry-picked countries to study to prove his hypothesis. Another It's not that he cherry-picked countries to study. It's that he chose a select amount of countries to study and then only reported seven of them that happened to when you plotted them on the graph that he chose bolster his claims. He was a shill from the sugar industry evinced by internal documentation of the Sugar Research Foundation paying off three Harvard professors, one of which went on to become the head of the USDA and helped to author the US 
USDA guidelines to cut fat and cholesterol since they caused heart disease. Chris, okay? Yes, you can convince people to believe a differing opinion if the entire opinion they hold is based upon lies they were told. Why are you discouraging people from exhibiting that behavior? That's actually intelligent. That's smart. You need a level of cynicism in your life or else you will be eaten alive in life. And Chris, you know this. This is ridiculous. This is atrocious. This is pretentious and patronizing as fuck and offensive, Chris. And you know it. You know how I know it? Because you are extremely socially intelligent and it's evinced by the way you're talking right now and the fact that you're a public speaker. He claimed moral outrage. I made a short episode about that and I'm not aware of people who watched who still believe it. It's like claiming Bruce Ames said, don't eat vegetables. So what is my takeaway to this episode? The funnel of misbelief reminds me of the path to type 2 diabetes. As we gain weight, eat poorly and forget to exercise, our pancreas slowly shrivels up. If we catch it before it goes- Actually, your pancreas starts shriveling up because of beta cell fatigue, that being damage. What causes the beta cells of the pancreas to be damaged, Chris? Perhaps glycation damage? Glucose causing glycation damage, Chris? I just covered this in the last video that I just recorded before this. Or it can regrow. If not, we're on insulin for life. The funnel of misbelief is like that. The further we go down the funnel, the less likely- When's insulin secreted? When is insulin secreted? In a very significant amount, Chris. Perhaps after the consumption of carbohydrates? That we can ever come back. The hardest thing for me is how can we point out misinformation without it sounding like criticism and driving people further down the funnel? Chris, don't act like you're curious in finding out about that and how to do such a thing. What you've done is you've strategically covered up your presentation to be perceived as magnanimous and well-intentioned, when in reality, it's very clear to anyone that has any amount of social intelligence that you're being a pretentious d is why I think it's so important to show real respect to people who believe different things than we do and stay friends with them. Yes, I don't have respect for patronizing attitude. And I don't have respect for, frankly, what I believe to be a complete lie coming out of your face when you say that, because I don't believe that you think that at all. I think that what you have in mind is to make people be perceived as silly. All, haven't we all slid partly down funnels of misbelief? We all believe things that aren't true. So why did I make this episode when some people will view it as criticism, hardening their misbelief? It's not because I like doing episodes like this, that's for sure. It's because I Bullsh always be grateful for people who saved many of us from false beliefs before we got too far down the funnel of misbelief. Maybe I can return the favor for people who haven't gone too far down a funnel for which there may be no return. Ugh. I wanted to end the episode here, but I sent it out for fact checking as usual. And the fact checkers came back and said, you should have addressed Anthony Chafee's background. The questions are everywhere on my channel, Reddit, Instagram, etc. Some people think he's like the liver king who became a very rich viral star by claiming raw liver is the superfood that built his amazing body. He used all the masculine marketing tricks liver king is a fraud and are suckers for. And then we found out he had an enormous helping of steroids to go with that liver, which he hadn't told him. Obviously he did. Anyone with any sense knows that. Dr. Chafee has a similar superfood diet and uses similar masculine market. He does not have a similar diet to Liver King at all. He doesn't eat organs and he also doesn't load up on carbs. Liver King does. Just got back to the lake house. This be a spoonful of Johnny Co Johnny, Johnny Honey collected with a blue-blooded barbarian bloodline mouth. And I collected this from the ranch. I'm going to drizzle it on top of melons that I harvested from the ranch. We have some ground cherries, fermented cream, some colostrum. And we've got the ground cherries. False, Chris. What a shock. I'm not aware of any other neurosurgeon who claims his diet cures Crohn's and IBS or who appears on podcasts making similar claims on topics ranging from cancer to fertility. I can understand how that could propel you to social media and tabloid superstardom, but spending so much time on social media doesn't give me reputable neurosurgeon vibes. I did look into his back. What a pretentious <laughs> Anthony Chafee is a medical doctor. Even if he weren't, just like me, I am just an author. He can say whatever the hell he wants online. Again, appeal to authority fallacy here. That and can understand the controversy. On his LinkedIn, he just lists medical doctor at some hospital. 
He has a resume online, but I don't see him listed where his resume says he works, even though they seem to list all the staff. His resume describes a very impressive rugby career, but Google is oddly silent about it. Maybe I'm just bad at internet search, but I'm... Or you're selectively choosing what to search and then saying that Anthony is not credible because he somehow has no proof that his initials proceeding his name are warranted to be there and belong there. That's what I think you're doing. And frankly, I don't give a f if he's a doctor or not. He's sensible when it comes to diet. That's all I care about. And even if he weren't, he has a platform on YouTube. He can say whatever the hell he wants. Free speech, Chris it being this difficult to verify the background of any other doctor. This definitely made me feel like a creeper, but it seemed important, so I wrote to the colleges he listed, such as Duke School of Medicine. That looks impressive on his resume. Duke responded that he enrolled in a four-week course there as a visiting student, but he was not enrolled in a degree program. So, Anthony... So? I don't personally care. And frankly, I'm not sure how this stuff works because I've never gone to university. Clip that, Chris. Clip it. Clip it. But I know that you can do a lot to hide your background from the public. A lot, if you wanted to. Maybe Anthony wanted to. I don't care. Anyway. You're watching I Have an Idea. People love the behind-the-scenes videos like Siobhan does. The emergency doctors have asked me to see two patients. The first has shortness of breath, and the other is an elderly patient who's had multiple falls at home. Neurosurgery is fascinating, and you could put all this controversy to rest. Frankly, I don't really know the context, so I'm going to say this humbly, but um, why are you recording yourself when you were just asked to see two patients? Because I'll tell you what, if I were in the hospital bed and you were doing that, oh, I'd be pissed. Okay, talk about it off the clock. Wow. Episode about your residency and a behind the scenes video of your career. I would love to be the first to say I wondered about your background, but you clarified it and it checks out. Okay, well, this was just an offensive video, and all of Chris's videos are offensive. 111,000 subscribers for a channel that is vapid, it's unsophisticated, and it's misleading, and all it does is use, of, all, all Chris does, is use a bunch of argumentative fallacies. At least that's all I saw in this video. This is the first video I've ever seen from Chris, ever. I don't go out of my way and look at vegetarian or vegan content, or even carnivore content. I keep to myself. People recommend videos to me, and I go, okay, yeah, I'll check this out. Oh, this is a channel. They're really popular. Okay, well, I'll check it out. I've never seen it before. Well, it's the same thing with this. Offensive, pretentious, the feigning of magnanimity is odious, it's repulsive, and the patronization here is beyond anything I've ever seen exhibited from someone. It's impressive. Anyway, if you enjoyed the video, please leave a like, please subscribe to the channel, please leave your thoughts in the comment section below, and also, once again, subscribe to the Patreon if you haven't already, and buy my book, Contraindicated, a closer look and revision of mainstream health axioms that are perpetuated illness disorder and disease for over a century if you have not bought that book already, and also, link on the bottom of the screen, what is that? That link. That is a link that will bring you to an amazing site with amazing products from an amazing brand known as Cerule. If you purchase product through that link, you will get a permanent 10% discount and permanent free shipping when signing up for monthly deliveries. If you'd like to learn more about these products, like who should take them, why you should take them, when to take them, what they even are in the first place, which I would recommend you do before taking any product or buying any product, I would refer to the link in the top right corner of the screen, the Cerule products link that will explain all those things that I just listed. And I would also further migrate to the description below to access a video between myself and Professor Bart K on these products in far further detail, as well as the company of Cerule itself, which I believe to be very important. Finally, email me at edgooky14 at gmail.com if you have any questions regarding anything at all. And with that being said, join me next time when someone else is not as patronizing and pretentious and insulting and offensive as Chris from Plant Choppers. So, till then.